record. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Renaissance Society of Sacramento and our program this evening, Printing in the Renaissance, presented by Mary Ellen Burns. No doubt you have interests in printing and or books or maybe the Renaissance, but uh, you'll get all that, I'm sure, and some other nuggets as well, because as everyone probably knows by now, there isn't a subject Mary Ellen Burns hasn't met that she hasn't loved in some form or fashion. So I'm sure she, whatever her love is with this one, she's going to be sharing that with us tonight. We're asking you to keep your video and audio muted and off. It does a couple of things. It helps uh, the internet connection um, for the most part. And um, then if you have questions, please post them in the chat and or at, at opportune moments. If Mary Ellen has a break, we'll ask you, uh, you can raise your hand electronically or put your video on and raise it uh, literally and we'll call on you and try to get those questions answered. But thank you again and please enjoy printing in the Renaissance. Mary Ellen. Thank you so much. Let me just get this started. And I apologize because I always. Great, thank you so much. This is again a talk about printing in the Renaissance. You're gonna wonder why I have Charlotte's Web by my favorite author and editor, E.B. White. When I was eight, I checked out Charlotte's Web, which is really the beloved children's classic from the mobile library that visited my neighborhood once a week. I was smitten not just by the story of the friendship between a pig uh, and named Wilbur and Charlotte, who was an amazing spider, but by the really sensuous feel of the book in my hand. The title, as you can see, was clearly hand-drawn with love. The impression of each letter had hit the paper in such a way as to make almost a slight dent in it which I could feel with my fingertips as I moved them under each word, the soft rag-like paper, the slightly raised ink, the delicious hand-drawn letters on the cover. I instantly fell in love with the tiny wordsmith and topographer and decided that I wanted to be both when I grew up. A couple of years later, my father introduced me to Henry Herskovic, a typesetter at the Sacramento Bee. He set type on a linotype machine, which placed entire lines of uh, type for printing at once, which was a method that really revolutionized the newspaper industry in the mid 1800s. But he preferred to set type by hand, one letter at a time, and to do fine letterpress printing on an old Heidelberg press he shared with other printer friends. I am the president of the Sacramento Book Collectors Club, we are a group that was formed in 1939 that was a collection of both fine printers and book collectors. And I now looking back on it realize that he most likely belonged to that group as well. Occasionally he would wear a, a printer's apron and I would inhale deeply as I love the incense like smell that emanated from both the apron and his fingertips. He said that ink was in his veins it was also etched deeply on the outside of his left forearm, proof that he had survived Auschwitz. At 13, I decided to dig deeper into the history of printing and was introduced to goldsmith Johannes Gutenberg, who allegedly, and we do have um, uh, people in the group that will help correct this story as well, started the printing revolution. I'll unravel and collect that story in tonight's presentation. These two photos, that's an old Heidelberg, one of the very original Heidelberg presses. Um, I would have one today if I had a space that was stable to have them. I have had many presses that have come and go out of my fingers. And on the right is um, type, hot type, which I collect. I can't tell you how many pounds I have of it. I was the most upset when I volunteered at a place called Knight's Boundary in Sutter Creek, and they were burning that type um, because there was no more use for it and all the printing machines. It was the uh, first story I wrote by the way, about Gutenberg that was actually published. 
It was printed on a mimeograph. I don't know if any of you remember a mimeograph machine. That was a duplicating um, machine housed in the teacher's lounge at my junior high school. It worked by forcing ink through a stencil onto paper. If it, if it wasn't already hooked, uh, that would have done it for me. The perfect combination of research, writing, publishing and distributing words on paper. My interest in printing, the history of topography, book design, publishing, newspapers, paper making, and fine printing hasn't abated in all that time. The Renaissance was a fervent period of European cultural, artistic, political, and economic rebirth following the Middle Ages generally described as taking place from the 14th century to the 17th century, the Renaissance promoted the rediscovery of classical philosophy, literature, and art. Some of the greatest thinkers, authors, statesmen, scientists, and artists in human history thrived during this era, while global exploration opened up new lands and cultures to European commerce. The Renaissance is credited with bridging the gap between the Middle Ages and modern day civilization. Tonight, I'm really going to focus on advances in printing. What this photo is, is four edge paintings that were done in the Renaissance. It's something I wish I could afford to collect. My brother has a few of them, but literally um, most of the time four edge paintings you can't see, you only see them when you flip the pages. One of my favorite other topics is Mark Twain. I love his quote, what the world is today, good and bad, it owes to Gutenberg. Everything can be traced to this source. Indeed, Gutenberg's innovation has long been regarded as an inflection point in human history, an innovation that opened the door to the Protestant Reformation, Renaissance, the scientific revolution, the advent of widespread education, and a thousand more changes that touch nearly everything we now know. And there is no doubt that the development of printing with movable uh, metal type had tremendous social, political, intellectual, religious, and edu educational ramifications. However, key innovations in what would become revolutionary printing technology began in East Asia with work done by Chinese nobles, Korean Buddhists, and descendants of Genghis Khan several centuries before Gutenberg was even born. The innovation that he is said to have created was small metal pieces that raised backwards letters arranged in a frame, coated with ink and pressed to a piece of paper, which allowed books to be printed more quickly. And if we have anyone of Korean or Chinese descent that can uh, improve on my pronunciations, please do that later. Cho Yun Wee did that, and he did it 150 years before Gutenberg was even born. The first overtures towards printing began even earlier than that, roughly 800 AD in China, where early printing techniques involved chiseling an entire page of text into a woodblock backwards, applying ink and printing pages by pressing them against the block. Around 971 AD, printers in Zhejiang, China, produced a print of a vast British canon called Tripitaka using 130,000 blocks like this, one for each page. Later efforts would create early movable type, including the successful but inefficient use of ideograms chiseled in wood and a really brief abortive attempt to create ceramic characters. Meanwhile, imperial imports from China brought these innovations to Korean rulers called Goryeo, who were crucial to the next steps in printing history. The earliest uh, extant movable type printed book is the Korean anthology of great Buddhist practices and Zen teachings. It dates to 1377 and has served as a starting point for scholarship on the origin of movable type. Korea regards it and other ancient volumes as national points of pride that rank among the most important of books. 
but it is only very recently, uh, possibly in the last few decades, that their viewpoint and the Asian people who created printing technologies have begun to be acknowledged at all. And I wanna say, I think that that's true. We have so focused on Western civilization that we're just now starting to give the Eastern um, civilizations their due. And I don't mean that to diminish the work of Gutenberg and other artisans working in Mainz and Strasbourg, such as Peter Schaefer and Johannes Fust, and the hundreds, if not thousands, of other printers that um, contributed. What is not disputed is that there was no major breakthrough. We like to think of this as, as being revolutionary, but it was something that was implemental. Gutenberg and his assistants, wherever they were living, adapted and perfected existing technologies. The press itself was um, adapted from a wine press. You can see that on the left. And wine presses uh, and presses would stamp patterns on fabrics and presses which squeeze the water out of paper. The ink itself was adapted from Flemish artist ink. The idea of printing most likely came from wooden block prints, which were already being sold and manufactured in Europe, both block prints for single sheets like playing cards and broadsides, which were small um, uh, posters, and block prints, which were bound together in small booklets. We didn't know that much about what was going on in the East, so that's why we look at these as occurring um, in tandem, but also we weren't as aware of what was happening there. The type itself was adapted from goldsmiths and silversmiths used to stamp their marks on finished products, though it was usually made of lead and lead and iron alloys. Gutenberg himself had been trained as a goldsmith and he and other smiths were adept at working with metals and stamps. The most contributor of these technologies was paper I, I uh, actually make my own paper as well. I was gonna bring up one of my screens. I would love to do a how-to on paper making at some point. Um, for if books would have been printed on the materials that were really available to Europeans in the high middle ages, they would have been so expensive that they would never have seen a wide market. Throughout the middle ages, manuscript books were produced in Europe on parchment paper, which was stretched sheepskin or vellum which was stretched calfskin. Both of these were really prohibitively expensive. They were stronger and more attractive than paper, but a large book such as the Bible would have required 170 calfskins or 300 sheepskins. Uh, I, we do have Richard Fuller who's with us tonight and I'm not gonna talk much about the Bible. So if you have questions about it, he's, um, uh, we're gonna throw some of those questions to him. During the 13th and 14th century, the techniques of paper making spread into Europe through Spain uh, from the Arabic countries. Paper was made from linen rags and hemp, which came from old rope. These fibers were then mixed with more water and a large flat wire sieve was dipped into the pulp. The pulp was then smoothed out over the sieve, the water was pressed out and the wet sheet of paper was placed on a felt sheet. This whole thing was squeezed in a press, hung out to dry, and then often covered with sizing. And I have to tell you that that's exactly how I make paper today. I use um, old paper. I don't throw scraps away, uh, threads from cloth or whatever. It's still a way of making homemade paper. The industry really needed a a tremendous amount of clean water. So paper mills were often upstream of towns or at the upstream end of rivers that flowed within towns. Manuscripts books and other documents, especially small pamphlet sized manuscript booklets were beginning to be written on paper by the 14th century. And most of Gutenberg's books and those of other early printers were printed on paper. Some of the most important books, however, continued to be produced on parchment and vellum. Gutenberg and other early printers, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I hate to say this, <clears throat> uh, but I might have to take a break <coughs> for just a second and use my puffer. Go ahead. <coughs> so if there's any questions, let me go get my puff. 
We'll wait for you to return. Thank you so much. I remember taking a class from Ed Sherman a number of years ago, and he talked about the whys of, of the Renaissance even to happen. I don't remember exactly what he shared. Oops, I forgot my light. But what was really fascinating to me that I hadn't heard before was it really was a shift in the political culture and the financial culture of Europe in that indentured servitude had kind of lost its its strength and people had more time, money, and interest to be able to evolve in all of the things that the Renaissance offered, which was art and science and culture and and that kind of thing. Anyone else have any other thoughts about that? Wayne has his hand up. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I had the, uh, uh, yeah. I collect coins. I do have some from Rome. And it's interesting that the invention of actual printing, printing of books to develop in the late Middle, late middle Ages in, in Asia mm -hmm. than in Europe. But the basic ability to make type existed in ancient times, but nobody ever thought to actually use it to, uh, to, for, for, for printing purposes. Uh, I thought it was kind of curious. There's a certain amount of imagination to really take something, that even though, even though techn technology was there to make, to work with metals, and to you know, and make uh, make letters out of metals. I mean, I sure have some from ancient times. They never, never, was never used for for printing until 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 in Europe, at least in Gutenberg. That's my comment. That's all. Great. Thanks for adding that. And I have to tell you, this is the first asthma attack I think I've had in three months. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> Good. So. Um, I, I do have to say again, I hope I remember where I was, that Gutenberg and other early printers didn't view what they had done as, as dramatic change either. Uh, like Wayne said, they were using existing technology. Instead, what they really viewed it is, it was a much faster way to copy. And the earliest printed books look as much uh, like manuscript books as possible. Only slowly did printers add such things as title pages and table of contents. Mary Ellen, we're not seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Let's let's start that one again. There we go. Okay, and I think we're on the, this. We're on the same slide, thank you. So, so only uh, uh, later did they stop abbreviating so heavily and started adding more space between words and more punctuation. Along with the technological advances which contributed to printing, printing and the mass production of books needed a market, which was provided by the rise in literacy throughout Europe and during the Renaissance. Uh, this can be explained, this might explain why these technologies were first combined only in the mid 15th century and not earlier, and why printing also spread so quickly. The technology of printing spread from the areas around Mainz and Strasbourg up and down the Rhine Valley to switch city, Swiss cities such as Basel and cities in the low countries such as Antwerp, then into the Danube Basin, to cities such as Augsburg and Nuremberg, then to Italy, particularly to Venice, where most of the modern type fonts were developed. And I have to say, that's another story I'd love to share with people. I'm fascinated by fonts and also printing in Greek and Hebrew. It spread to England, especially in London and to France, especially Paris and Lyon in the 1470s. And by 1480, about 110 cities in Europe had presses. It continued to spread to Spain and Scandinavia. And by 1500, roughly 50 years after the first printed books, over 200 cities and towns in Europe. Scholars estimate and this really surprises me, that there were somewhere between 8 million and 20 million incunables or books printed before 1500. You have to remember that he didn't perfect the machine until um, 1450 and didn't produce the first book until 1455, the first Bible. Um, 
This, of course, vastly exceeded the number of books that had been produced in all of Western history up to that point. The amounts were so fantastic that some people saw printing as an invention of the devil. This opinion didn't halt the spread of printing, however, and by 1600, scholars estimate that there had been about 200,000 different books or editions printed in press runs that averaged about 1,000 copies each. Now that in America's market is about how many books are produced per year in the United States. That was up to this time. Um, and a thousand copies might seem like a small press run if you compare it to the modern blockbusters or New York Times bestsellers, but it's roughly comparable to the size of a press run for a normal nonfiction book or an academic tome that's published today. Uh, that's literally the tops that most publishers will print or sell, about 1,000. The average of actual sales is less than 500. By 1600, printing had also spread to the European colonies and empires in the Americas, India, Japan, and China. In Europe, <clears throat> the early book trade was tied together by an international book fair held twice annually in Frankfurt on Main and still held today. I have not yet been able to go to it, but it is on my bucket list. I do follow book um, uh, uh, pu and publishing things like this all over the world though. I just haven't gotten there yet. At this fair, book um, authors and printers and publishers, paper makers, book binders and illustrators all came to actually find each other. So it wasn't to, um, to get a market for the work so much as to get people to contribute to the publication of the books themselves. Loans would be floated, contracts made, books would be stored. Because of the book fair, the city of Frankfurt became an island of toleration in the religious disputes, which ended up splitting Germany beginning in the 1520s. The financing of early print shops often came from private patrons or government leaders, for books really required a large investment for equipment and supplies, and the product often took years to sell. Early on, printers also diversified their products, alternating large fancy works with small pamphlets, forms, and posters, which would sell quickly and give them a quick return. Many printers also searched for patrons who would finance the entire cost of publishing a book. And I might uh, clarify that um, I'm not gonna talk about it much today, but the internal side of the book and the bindings were done in uh, different uh, places. I'm not gonna talk about the books and binding my, uh, uh, tonight. Printers themselves became men and a few women I have not been able to locate a name, Richard Fuller might know some, who bridged many worlds of the Renaissance. They were trained through an apprentice program in the same way that artisans were. In the first generation, often as goldsmiths or silversmiths, and then directly as printers. A boy, and it was almost always a boy, would be contracted by his parents, uh, usually by his father, to a master printer as an apprentice. He would work for five to 10 years in that capacity, then become a journeyman printer and worked for maybe another five to 10 years. Then if he had the capital to establish his own shop and could make a masterpiece acceptable to other printers, he opened a shop and began hiring apprentices and journeymen himself. The women who became printers were generally not formally apprenticed, but learned the trade from their fathers or their husbands. Women printers were not numerous, but there were often a few women in most large printing centers, usually widows who published books independently and whose names often appeared on the title page. Thus printing was in many ways a new kind of occupation combining intellectual, physical and administrative forms of labors and skills. The world of the Renaissance print shop was where many different types of people met and gathered and where many different types of people were encouraged to become authors as well as readers. And what did printers of the Renaissance produce? They would literally produce anything that would sell. They were really very quick to discover that there was a market for both among the general reading public and among specialized group of readers such as physicians and lawyers um, to tailor those offerings for those 
uh, market specifically. They might produce a book for a, a lawyer such as legal codes like that of the Roman Emperor Justinian, collection of customary laws and legal commentaries, and all would be bound in fancy leather bindings in matching sets. They produced books for doctors and surgeons, pharmacists and midwives, produced um, such as herbals, books of instruction and classical medical treatises. They produced books for students such as manuals of language instruction, grammars, dictionaries, cheap editions of the classics, often bound in paper in smaller formats so that students could easily carry them to class. They produced books and other printed material for members of the clergy, Latin missals, breviaries, and psalters, and indulgent forms in which the name of the person whose sins were being forgiven could be filled in later. Their major market, however, was the urban literate middle classes. And what did they want to read? Mostly they wanted to read religious materials, the best-selling authors, particularly after the Reformation in the 1520s, uh, but even before were religious. This was both because people were interested in religion in general and in their own salvation, and because also religious works were cheap, lively, illustrated, and often gory. They literally were the adventure novels of today. Of course, they were plenty of uh, extremely expensive whole Bibles published in very small paperback editions of one, two, or three sermons, putting them well within the reach of most literate buyers. In terms of their tone, they were much more like a modern political debate, the sort of thing that we might now see on Sunday television, no longer in the press, I'm afraid to say, uh, than a complicated theological treatise. People did not spend all their time reading religious materials, however, and printers recognized very early that there was a market for other types of books and pamphlets. They printed historical romances, such as those of King Arthur and Tristan and Isolde. They printed biographies of historical and contemporary figures, and the more scandalous, the better. How-to manuals were very popular, such as herbal books or books of home remedies for everything from the headache to the plague. There were guides on how to manage your money, how to run a household, how to write love letters and business letters. There was also pornography, and I'm not going to show you one. I have a, a from about the same time period, a Chinese erotica from 1480 that I don't quite get as erotic, but it was considered pornography at the time. And of course, cookbooks also often illustrated. There were guides for travelers with handy phrases, discussion of the weather, and descriptions of the strange customs of foreign lands. In short, they were very much like the books that we have today. After the voyages of discovery, printers discovered that people liked to read about the experiences of more adventurous travelers, and Columbus notebooks were frequently reprinted along with those of other travelers. Enterprising publishers frequently gathered together the most bizarre and exciting stories in one volume and might call it something like Tales from Foreign Lands or something similar, often neglecting to mention that these were gathered from many sources and often contained totally fictitious accounts mixed in with real ones. Most of the time, they had never actually traveled to the place they were describing. Among this kind of travel book, those that concentrated on strange animals and uh, creatures were often called bestiaries. And I thought I had a bestiary uh, with me, but I don't, my apologies. Uh, they created uh, these bestiaries, which really described um, normal animals like hedgehogs and porcupines, although giving really wild stories about their habits and abilities. Real ones had heard about such things as giraffes and rhinoceroses and fictitious one like centaurs, mermaids, and cyclops. All of these animals were always listed in alphabetical order with no distinction made between those that were real and those that were not. Most of the secular works were bound in cloth or leather and had 64 or more pages. These were meant to be bound in cloth or leather and had um, 
uh, were handed down from one generation to the next. They are mentioned in wills and inventories showing that books were really quite valuable. And I'm going to go back and show you a collection here that I missed over. These are two broadsides. So in addition to um, books, printers also produce much smaller, cheaper booklets that were also often religious and secular. They were uh, either broadsides, which were single page or um, um, single page like posters, or they had eight, 16 or 24 pages and were called chapbooks, very similar to the chapbooks we still have for poetry today. These are equivalent in some ways of our modern newspapers and magazines for the first newspaper in England was not published until 1620. They were written in very simple language with a small vocabulary and uh, again were often illustrated so that those who were illiterate or barely literate could also get something from them. They would be sold by wandering peddlers who often sold other things such as pins, needles, marbles, and printed playing cards. It's really difficult to know how many of these chapbooks were produced or exactly what they contained, as they had paper covers and were uh, very ephemeral. The, the paper also was not of the highest quality and so would deteriorate more quickly, especially with, uh, with books. Uh, from those that have survived and uh, from discussions of them and other sources, we can tell that many of them were about recent battles and heroes. And uh, this is a little old fashioned, but it would be like, I was trying to think of what we get regularly, the equivalent of time in Newsweek say, or about new inventions, tools, techniques for farming and building like popular mechanics or about famous people and what was happening to them. Renaissance version of um, people or whatever, those magazines are still out or about freakish events and strange occurrences, babies, animals born with birth defects that were perceived as monsters, which was the Renaissance version of the National Enquirer. Printers realized that people were uh, interested in monsters and in certain recent events that often printed single broadsheets to get the news out as quickly as possible. These were usually illustrated and then sold on street corners. This is a sample of one of them. Beginning in the 16th century, the printers began to gather all of their uh, things together into uh, almanacs. Um, this is actually um, the bestiary. My apologies, it got out of order. And this is the slide of those things that are illustrated. Beginning in um, the 16th century, printers began to gather all of these things together into almanacs, adding witty sayings, moral maxims, humor, horoscopes, and other astrological predictions long-term weather forecasts and agricultural advice. We often think of Benjamin Franklin as the inventor of the almanac, but he was following a really long line of distinguished printers and predecessors in recognizing the market for this among a largely agricultural society. These small books and broadsides provided printers and publishers with a quick return on their investment and allowed them to print fancier and longer things which sold more slowly and were much more expensive to produce. So what were the effects of all of this on European uh, culture? I wanna thank Mary Wiesner Hanks from the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, whom I've heard many times talk on this subject. I've adopted uh, this talk um, from a lot of his scholarship and these are the six areas that he talks about. The first is scholarship. Print really halted the corruption of text by copyists, giving everyone for the first time identical text. It spurred on the already existing search for the oldest and the best copies of any work and the production of critical editions. It helped the recovery of Greek and other ancient languages, such as Hebrew among Western Europeans. The concept of indexing, which only made sense when you could produce about a thousand copies, that were identical made the retrieval of information much easier. Science. Scientific research became a much more collaborative effort with results published quickly. Public dialogue and print became standard with results of experiments corroborated by others, 
all of which sped up the development of ideas. When we go to have our conversation, I would love for those of you that are knowledgeable in these six areas to contribute what you want to this discussion. Education. Learning to read was much easier as print was standardized and made clearer. Individuals could now afford to own books without having to copy themselves. So university lectures were no longer simply someone reading a book aloud. Books freed one from the need for constant memorization. I might also mention that universities thrived during this period as well because they had access to texts and some of the best libraries in the world were created at the same time. Art. Engravings and prints reached a much wider audience. So some artists became known throughout Europe. Manuals with illustrations, such as those of plants, animals, and machines, gradually became much more lavishly illustrated, and greater care was taken to make all illustrations completely accurate. It would be really easy for me to just concentrate on the work of a few of these illustrators, including Albrecht Durer, uh, from the Renaissance and Hans Holbein, but then we would be here all evening and it is a still almost hot, almost summer night. <laughs> Languages. The distinction between a language with printed literature and one without became much, much sharper. So languages that had extensive printed um, uh, uh, literature came to be considered national languages and those without printed materials, local dialects. Once this happened, the borders between two languages, such as that between, say, French and German, or French and Spanish, became much sharper. Once national languages were, were printed, people began to call for purifying and codifying them, and for the first time were bothered by such things as spelling irregularities. Printing also slowed down the rate at which languages changed. The French were especially um, a very careful about language and codification of things, not only in words, but in art, that there were whole schools that you had to follow. And law. The concept of copyright and plagiarism gradually emerged. The idea that one could have monopoly rights over ideas or words. Related to these were government attempts at controlling ideas and words, attempts at censorship that began almost as soon as printing began. When I was doing research, I was shocked to find out how often Charlotte's Web has been on the banned books uh, in local libraries and schools. We can talk about that later as well. Governments all over Europe attempted to control printers in a way that, that they had not controlled copyists for they perhaps like the earliest printers recognized that having a thousand copies of something was very different than having only one. That meant that if they could correct one, they couldn't con uh, uh, correct all of them. Government can attempt to control printing in a variety of ways, though giving um, often through giving one printer the exclusive rights to a certain book or type of book, which was termed privilege, and through issuing government seals of approval, which were termed copyright. And these are laws that are still in effect, obviously, today. That's another class we could do. <laughs> Printing accelerated the diffusion of ideas. That's what I really wanted to stress. Uh, they enlarged and invigorated every issue. It reduced the need for interpersonal contact, especially among scholars, and aided in some ways in the decompartmentalization of knowledge. It reduced one's dependence on the immediate senses and strengthened the imagination. For better or for worse, the first time in Europe, um, there was really mass culture. People in all parts of Europe could hear the same music, read the same poets, listen to the same sermons, make the same dresses, idolize the same kings and ladies, recognize the same artists. Print brought with it the uh, chance for greater diversity because one could know how other people all over the world thought and acted and much greater uniformity as now many thousands of people could come to know exactly the same things. Again, I would like to, um, thank Mary Wisner Hanks at the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin and the websites that I borrowed graphics and other material from. 
And I'm opening this up now for Q&A and I'm going to stop the share. So Christy, is okay. there anything in the chat? Yeah, we've had uh, a lot of comments in general. Uh, when you first started and talked about Charlotte's Web, uh, <laughs> you mentioned uh, third, her third grade graders loved the book every year and had and she had them read them read it in class. Um, someone asked uh, that or mentioned they'd love to uh, would love to have a presentation on how to make paper. So um, just planting that seed. If you're interested in doing such a thing. Uh, we, we can actually do that in person and film it and, and send that out virtually. So Lawrence Fox is not here tonight. Both of us have all the material we need and we have a space at 25th and R that we can do that. So Kristen, also, Kristen also said her third graders and junior high kids love to make paper. So um, it sounds like a great, uh, a great thing to learn. Uh, was there much artwork in Renaissance books? And if so, how was the artwork printed is the question. Okay, and, and I am gonna ask Richard if, if you wanna correct me on this. So what you did with movable type was you were able to lay type. Uh, most of the illustrations, am I right, Richard? We're still done with wooden blocks? I think, there, I think for, for example, when, uh, when uh, Gutenberg printed his, yeah. They were he printed like a, a 184 Bibles, something like that. Right. And each of them, in each of them, my recollection is that the, the illustrations were different each time. Yes. They were different. I'm not starting a video. And so <laughs> then uh, not only were they different, they also were, were illustrated differently. I mean, somebody got on there and on each of those Bibles and, and, and hand wrote some things around those illustrations. So it's very, very complex, but I'm not an expert at it. So and it's, just, it's I, went down to, I went down to Los Angeles and saw the, the Bible down there, uh, the, the Gutenberg Bible down there. There are only 184 printed, I think it was. And it just, uh, it, it's a miraculous thing, but I'm not an expert at it. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that for a lot of people that could afford those Bibles and they were, uh, you know, expensive, the binding and the illustrations, they wanted to be unique to them. Sometimes they would hire their own artist yes. to illustrate the, the book themselves. Yes. Because they still, even though they were, quote, mass produced, wanted them to be very individual types of copies. Right. Right. Well, yeah. Go ahead. I have a few thoughts. If you ask me to do these these thoughts that I that uh, I was prepared, I made some notes here. But since you covered almost everything, I'm just going to make a couple of quick comments. Okay. One is the people that get that get left out of this entire process or this entire discussion are the Maya. Yeah, you're right. The My Maya did amazing things. They they wrote things that are, it looked like Bible. It looked like books. And then the Spanish showed up and destroyed something like 98, they just burned about 98% of the great work that the Maya had done is unbelievable. That's one. Second, when I did this class in the Bible, the thing that I recall most about it was that the Old Testament was finished about 100 AD and it had 39 books. The New Testament was also finished about 100 AD and it had 27 books. So that's 66 books. They were both finished about 100 AD. And the first time they were put into a printed book by Gutenberg, that's 1,355 years later. So these things were, were somewhere, they're being copied by somebody, they're being stored somewhere, but they weren't printed for 1,355 years. To me, that's the most amazing thing of the Bible. All right, so Richard, can I, I, I hate to, to, uh, to ask this question because you did do a class on the Bible. It was my understanding that the Bible, you know, that there were revisions, especially like in the year, right around 1000, whatever, of what went into uh, each of those. Yes. Are you saying that the original text is what he produced and not? No, the ones no. no, 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 no. He did not, no, he produced the one that was, that was, it, it had evolved over those 1355 oh, years. He printed the latest version. And, and one of the most amazing things is in these 1,355 years, everybody who copied it did their own thing. They may have, they may have changed things to suit their own needs. And then the next person who, who copied it, copied in the changes. It's just amazing that it lasted so long 
before someone finally put it in print. Uh, I'm going to go back to the question from Sandy um, on how was the work, uh, the artwork printed. Um, even illuminations, I, I want to make really clear, the, the print was done in black and white. And if I'm correct with Gutenberg, one other color, which was red. Um, I, I could be wrong. So most of the coloring was done after the fact. Correct. So they would, would have been hand colored. Yes. Um, um, and individual pages, when it came to binding, am I right? Individual pages. I know Larry's got his hand and probably knows the answer to this. Larry, did you want to, um, since you were going to help with this talk, did you want to add to the discussion here? Well, all I was going to say is when I went to my first trip to Europe, I did go to Mainz and went to Gutenberg's um, press uh, place. And um, so I was wondering if anyone else had made it there too, because it was one of it was really seemed to be something I needed to do when I traveled the first time. And no. Nick, uh, I'm going to ask Larry one other question because he might know this one. Larry is really a specialist in Persian literature um, and artwork. When did colors first appear? And Richard, if you can answer this one as well, when did colors first appear in print? Oh, I, I think well, I think colors. Okay, here, let me get my. I'm not sure. Here, let me get my color on. Like, well, you know. Okay, I think color has been around forever, especially yeah. in um, Islam and uh, China, and all, everyone is doing hand hand painted artwork because um, most of if they did printing, it would be black and white, and then they would always watercolor over it or use some other kinds of specialized paints or or gilding. So I think you know it's been something that's been going on forever. Everyone had to. The best That's books exactly were always what Gutenberg people did. They painted it after the printing. Right. Amazing. And uh, and again, for illumination was often done by uh, by women um, that would do the illuminations. And and I, I'm hoping that that someone knows at least of some uh, fiction books or nonfiction books that talk about the role of women because it was really hard, or at least you know. I'm, as Christy says, I'm doing so many of these talks, I didn't get to it. Um, there was a comment uh, there about Bart. Er, er, right. His name was Bart Ehrman. Right. That, so that guy's written about 20 books. Okay. About the Bible. 20 books. He's from University of North Carolina. In the last book he wrote, he said, you know, I've, I've done all this research on the Bible and on Jesus and the whole concept. He said, the result of my all my research is that I don't have any beliefs anymore. <laughs> His last book. I didn't. I don't believe anything. All my deep, intense research about the the divinity of Jesus. I don't believe in it. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, so Larry, I'm throwing this one to my artist. This is why I wanted Larry part of this talk from the very beginning. When did uh, colored ink appear in titles, etc., as opposed to color wash? Um. I'm not sure if, well, I think colored ink was more of a modern situation, especially when they had other um, multiple, um, well, the, the Japanese were doing colored um, prints uh, with layers of wood that, so that each color would have a separate block. Right. They were doing those from the probably 13th century on, but uh, I, think, I think it was more of a modern thing for Europe until they saw, and so they saw the Chinese and other, other works, but it was just really um, labor intensive to do any multiple colors. Good, thank you. Thank you for Larry and Richard for being here. Uh, Jack, I think that you had a, a question you wanted to know. Um, it's Mary, uh, and uh, I apologize. I should have had his name up at the very, very beginning. I'll, I'll make sure that it goes in the chat. Okay. Um, Thanks. So it's um, it's um, Mary M E R R Y Eisner Hanks, but I I have enough of a dyslexia today to to reverse those. So um, any other uh, comments that we have, or people who would like to um, ask either a question or make some additional comments? Wayne, your hand is back up. It looks like. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Uh, yes, uh, you brought up the, uh, the question of, uh, of censorship, and, right. and that was, that's kind of interesting because right. the, uh, you had the, the Catholic Church actually had an index of forbidden books, 
And typically in those that period, books had to be licensed. In fact, I mean, John Milton and Aeropatica actually uh, argued for uh, the end of the need to license books. And, and those that time period in the 1600s, uh, it's my understanding that the freest country in, in, in Europe was, was, was the Netherlands. And uh, so you think it would be published there, it could not be published elsewhere in Europe. Uh, so it's also interesting that when Japan cut off contact with Europe about the same time, uh, they did allow one and only one country to trade with, with uh, a European country to trade. And that was that was the Dutch. So they had access to uh, uh, the least censored scientific books anywhere in Europe. Good point. And um, uh, so, point. so somebody says, why was uh, Charlotte's Web banned? I'm going to throw that out to people first because I was shocked at some of the reasons. Anybody want to comment on why they think Charlotte's Web might have been banned? Before I answer some of them. So oftentimes it was banned because of um, uh, it was communistic. <laughs> Here, here's this uh, you know group of animals. Uh, in the, it, they put it in the same class as George Orwell. They thought that uh, you know here's a a, a spider um, who's doing something that you know God didn't allow them to do, which is to write and to have consciousness and all those other things. Uh, but they formed together as a way to be able to stop, um, uh, you know, killing a pig, which is meant to be killed. That's what pigs are for, right? They don't have a, a right to life. Uh, some people didn't like the vegetarian theme that they thought that, um, uh, that the book promoted. Right, that that was part of it as as uh, well. So people have come up with, um, uh, but the biggest reason was the fact that we were even dealing with death. They didn't believe that the average child that reads Charlotte's Web was probably my age when it happened, which is about eight, and they thought the mere talk about death, because not only is Charlotte trying to save Wilbur from certain death, but she dies in the end. And even though it was a celebration of life later because she leaves all these um, hundreds of, of little baby spiders, they, they didn't like that. So uh, somebody said blasphemous, blasphemous, I like that, <laughs> and unnatural. And Emmelyn Parker says, do you know about Mike Parker, the topographer who re redesigned or designed uh, most of the print used in books and newspapers like New Helvetica? Uh, are you talking about the creator of Helvetica type, Evelyn? So she's not answering. You unmute yourself. I'm asking you to unmute, Evelyn. There you go. I just wanted a clarification of the, of the question because there's a wonderful a film about uh, the creation of Helvetica type, type uh, especially in fonts in general. I actually uh, collect them. And if that's this, the same person, I, I've seen it. If it's somebody else, I apologize. Uh, Marianne wants to know, do you ever include bookworms in your talk and how they always ate the page between the print lines because they didn't like the taste of ink? No, and I'm going to from now on. So thank you, Marianne. Um, I, I love bookworms. Uh, that's another one of those weird collections that you like to collect. Uh, people, I like graphics of bookworms. I like people who have given me little ceramic bookworms or whatever. Uh, but you're right, they didn't like the, the ink. Uh, again, I'm going to go to uh, Larry on this one. Larry, the, the, the type of inks that they were using were Flemish inks. Were they more insect resistant than other inks? Do you know? Um, I don't know that, but I know that um, inks were, you know, like you were saying, that um, the technology would have used what was existing and then improved on it as time went on more than um, starting, you know, with untried materials. So obviously when um, science got a little bit more um, adv advanced with um, chemistry, then the inks would improve. So it was, you know, had to do with science. 
the you chemistry. Don't anything else, great. Uh, Kristen says one reason was because of talking animals. You are uh, you are absolutely right. Somebody also mentions there's only one more uh, presentation on a right? And so for everyone that came to us through Eventbrite, I will, when I send out the link to this program, and it's going to be on YouTube, we'll send you the links. It's, it's the same link you use today. Exact same link. So if for some reason I miss you. Same one that you use today gets you into the next three talks. And the next three talks are next Wednesday, I believe, which is uh, May 12th. And that's going to be the city of immigrants. And then the next day is a city called Junction, which is a story of Roseville with Christina Richter, again, seven o'clock. And on May 18th, we have a program at seven o'clock called Dining on the Rails with Marilyn Summerdorf. Uh, for those of you that are away from us, we apologize. That makes it 10 o'clock at night. In the fall, we are going to be doing some of these evening programs a little earlier. Uh, to be able to capture people on the East Coast. And um, the other question is, I've really been enjoying them. Uh, we're not gonna be doing a lot of original programming this summer, but we are going to be uh, still doing a program called the Cook's Tour in which we do presentations and all of those are gonna be on Eventbrite. In fact, all of our community presentations and speaker series in the fall will be on Eventbrite this year, every last one of them. And so uh, we have made a decision that these presentation series and speakers are um, really useful. We want to encourage people from all over the country to connect with us. We hope that you become a member of Renaissance at some point and support the programs because it does, even though I'm a volunteer, Christy's a volunteer, uh, the other teachers here, Larry's talk, uh, Jack Gouget is a volunteer. There's a lot of you in this call tonight. It still costs money to produce stuff, uh, but we thought it's a way of really engaging the community and being able to have discussions of, about things with different viewpoints and diversity. I will mention that one of the things I'm most excited about for the fall is a presentation series by a man by the name of Les Francis, who spent 40 years in Washington, DC. His summer program is gonna be on the 26th Amendment. Uh, we'll have a series of programs on voter suppression and also on um, the, the youth vote. And then he's going to be doing a series in the fall. My apologies. I thought I had that turned off. He's going to have a series in the fall in which he's going to have at least three Pulitzer Prize winning um, authors who've written books on Jimmy Carter, Revisit the Jimmy Carter Legacy, Jonathan Alter, Kai Bird, Stu Eisenstein, and uh, he's even talking about possibly having Madeline Albright. So those will be open to everyone. If you have a program you'd like to teach, please let us know. We are not against what we call kind of pop-ups. If you've got an idea that you want to um, have us find a speaker or do a speaker on, we are quite quite willing to promote it. Christy, did you want to add anything to that or Jack Gouget? Well, I guess I would just put a, um, a note out there about uh, Alter Egos, our group in Renaissance yes. that is... Uh, designed to encourage people who have any interest in readers, theater type, type um, acting, performing, writing, not just uh, uh, pre-written stories, but maybe stories of your own. Um, we invite you to join us and we're going to probably integrate a bit with the Cook's Tour right. and, uh, and build on what we've already had. If you haven't seen any of our our performances so far so if you if you always thought you might like to try a little performing or or even writing for somebody uh that's performing please come and join us because we'd love to have you and also i forgot one other event i'm so excited about it's going to be june june 5th will be the actual sale but um i talked about all that clutter and all that ephemera and the 500 pieces of art that there's no room to hang on my wall um, a lot of that is going to be for sale and the proceeds from that will go 50, 50, well, actually 33, 33, 33 to the Sacramento Poetry Center, which is wonderfully letting us use their space at 25th and R Street. 
um, theater creations, uh, California Stage, which is producing live theater, music, storytelling, radio plays uh, through October 31st. And also um, the um, Associated Students of Sacramento um, Food Pantry. So I'm, I'm giving it away. If you guys want to come volunteer, uh, Wayne Looney, if you want to come buy some books cheap, we're, we're selling cheap for that one. So everybody will get notice of that as well. Good. Good. Uh, Mary Ellen, this is Jack. Yes, Jack. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, some people are kind of lying low, taking a break over the summer. Well, a number of volunteers uh, from the Renaissance are doing the same thing. They're, they're ca catching their breath. We are, however, about to make the decision of the method of sending out links for 50 plus recordings for presentation, uh, bits and pieces, form, the forums. And I believe there's another one, but I can't remember what it is right now. But they will, the notices will come out weekly, starting probably around June 7th. And uh, we may have five, six links uh, per week, or we may, uh, we're still looking at, at the impediments of, of uh, sending them all out at once. So people can, um, you know, uh, look at those, click on the link, and watch the recording in the middle of the night if they're so inclined. So those will be available. Wonderful. Jack, thank you so much. And Ruth has her hand up. Ruth, did you want to um, let me ask you to do your camera so you could ask you to start your video? Ruth. <laughs> OK. Um, yes. <laughs> Take my sticky off. <laughs> <laughs> Put a sticky on there. <laughs> anyway, uh, just to add to what Jack said, there's going to be a lot coming up. Uh, registration um, for anything in the summer and registration to join starts June 1st. Um, the catalog will be out August 9th uh, for the fall. August um, 16th, you can begin registering for courses. Rendezvous, which is when you can uh, meet virtually uh, and hear a presentation about the different courses is going to be uh, August 20th. And the first day of classes in the fall is September 7th. Um, and, and anybody would, you know, certainly is welcome to join. Uh, one of the things we talked about today in the uh, membership committee is having a reprise of some of the best sessions that we've had over the year. And Jack alluded to that, but we may pick out of different courses, maybe one session that was really good and do it again live. So you don't have to just watch your recording, but you'll see all that in your uh, weekly announcements. So definitely we'll keep you apprised of that. Good, thank you. And uh, I, I might add that um, th th there's other ways of doing that too. And Kelsey Marr, who is helping us with our catalog and did the sneak peeks before, we are actually going to try something. I don't know if anybody noticed, but I only did 30 minutes of actual speaking uh, before I started choking. <laughs> we like the idea of these shorter talks. So what we talked about doing is um, I might not have choked up if I had been able to um, come on, said hello to everybody where we have these conversations, which I think are crucial. I want to see more of that, uh, but then have just the presentation, which is maybe only a half an hour, be pre-recorded and then come back for live talk. And that way we don't end up with any glitches, but we end up with better quality programs. And through groups like Alter Egos, Christy doesn't know this, but we uh, just were invited to apply for a grant that would help support the alter egos for us to pay for somebody to video these for us uh, or to, um, to help. Doing bits and pieces of even your story, two or three minutes, everyone has a story that they wanna share that we can put together. We wanna do more of those events as well. So thank you for, uh, this is feeling like winding down. Um, is there anything you wanted to say, Christy, before I stop the recording? And then what we always do is go into the green room. Some of you are too shy to be recorded. 
But is there anything you wanted to say to kind of wrap up or say about Renaissance? I'm excited about whatever is ahead of us. I think it's we've been an incredibly successful organization through this pandemic year, but we've only got good things ahead and looking forward to whatever it is. And thank you so much again, Mary Ellen, for a great program tonight.